to. On the record today explores the question, the age of unreason and ignominy can we judge the people's judgment. This is based on a paper recently delivered by Brazilian professor Giorgio Romano Skitter at the Mapungube Institute for Strategic Reflection, their annual lecture. As an associate professor of international relations and economics, he also asks whether Africa and South Africa in particular can avoid a decline in global humanism, which seems to be defined by anti-immigration and super neoliberal policies. Uh, given recent events, he shares Brazilian case studies with us, so with our two countries sharing similar socio-economic conditions. Professor Giorgio Romano Skitter, a very warm welcome to you and thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for the invitation. So perhaps let's just start off with the theme of the paper that you delivered at the lecture. In broad strokes, what was the point of that? What exactly were you asking for? For those whom the title may be a little bit too academic, as some of us were sure. struggling to, to, to grapple yeah, yeah. with it. Yes. No, sure. Now, basically, uh, Brazil and uh, South Africa had had uh, it's a long history of relations and cross-identification and the trade union movement and the government. We had these this relations through IPSA, the Indian Brazil South Africa, yes. and then in the BRICS. And uh, Brazil was always an inspiration during the Lula government and the Dilma government. We had a lot of progresses, job creation and social projects. And suddenly, uh, instead of an inspiration, uh, Brazil became a, a nightmare. Instead of part of the solutions, it becomes part of the problems. And this happened in a very short time. Uh, we have to remember that President Lula left office at the end of 2010 with 85% of approval rates mm. and he is now in jail f without having any evidence uh, of wrong, real wrongdoings, no, no financial accounts in Switzerland or whatever. Uh. So this is all very irrational. Uh. But we have to understand, uh, so the idea was to try to understand what are the different uh, you have to explain it. Uh, we can't bl blame the people for having voted an extreme right uh, uh, president, uh, mm. President Bolsonaro, which is now uh, trying to, to run the, the country since the 1st of January. So that's basically what... So uh, what, what would you say, just looking at uh, President Lula's trajectory, would you say, what would you pinpoint as the problem? And I want us to learn from Brazil, looking at current South Africa. You said when he was first elected, there was a great euphoria that a workers' president uh, was uh, being elected. And, and how does he then uh, fall to what some see as a populism, or especially from the right movement? Yeah, no, but the, the euphorism was especially at the end of his government. Mm. Uh, after eight years of government, there was enormous support for Lula. Uh, and that's why he was able to elect the first woman president. It was not very known, uh, Dilma. And even during her first term, uh, there was, uh, at the end, there was a record low unemployment. Uh, uh, there was um, high buying power for the uh, minimum wage. That, and she was re-elected in Octo October 2014. So it went very rapidly, October 2014. Uh, so we have to understand uh, the problems that we faced uh, at the international level, uh, the consequences, uh, although delayed, but the very strong uh, consequence of the 2008-2009 crisis, uh, all the, the increase in, in competitivity in international uh, uh, commerce, the difficulties for industry in Brazil. And so people got uh, frustrated that progress was not going on. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, um, so we can say on the one hand, uh, the poor people got frustrated that the, this, the economic problems that arose basically you know, the slowdown of the international commodity prices, among other things, and, and the, the rich people, they, they felt that we needed to change because they, sh they, sh they thought that changes were going too fast and that their privileges would be at risk. So you had these very contradictory... Uh, so on the one hand, people wanted to go further with social change and on the other hand, people wanted to fend their privileges and thought that further social change would attack the privileges. And on top of that, the United States, as I heard it was said, uh, by the president uh, uh, in your program uh, before here, 
uh, that the United States is suddenly reinventing the Monroe Doctrine, uh, which means to rediscipline the countries in Southern America. Now, Lula or Dilma had never had an anti-American policy, but in the views of Trump, uh, in the views of not only Trump, in the view of the United States, uh, Brazil had gone far, had gone too, far too far in its independent uh, uh, foreign policies mm. with the BRICS, with the relations with China, with India, South Africa, uh, which was outside of their control. So you had on the one hand these, these national and international forces that felt that uh, we should stop this wave of social change. And on the other hand, we had the poor people, part of it, and the, especially also the lower middle class who felt that, that, they were, that it was not going fast enough, the changes, and, mm. and that they didn't got the real benefits out of it. And, and yeah. the rising nationalism that we're seeing, which are leaning more to the right in, yeah. in, in parts of Europe, yeah. we, we've seen, in, some say even in the UK, with the appointment of... Right. Uh, um, the new Prime Minister, you mentioned Donald Trump, has that been the reason why you had the results of the 2018 election, election yeah. outcome in Abu Dhabi? Yeah. Well, the 2018 election outcome was a total surprise, eh? because till the, when Lula was put in jail in May, up till then, in all the polls, he would be the candidate of the Workers' Party, he would win the election. There was no doubt about that. So he had to be put in jail to prevent him winning the election. But the script was that the center-right, liberal, democratic uh, uh, candidate would win the election. And the surprise is that this candidate at the end got only 4%, and the guy who won the election was completely outsider in, in the mm. political sense, although he has been member of parliament for many years, of the extreme right. Uh, extreme right which openly attacks women's rights, uh, openly attacks the, uh, the idea of climate change as being uh, fake news, and, and, and who, who, who really is com something completely new for uh, Brazil uh, policies. Now, this nationalism uh, if for the, the, of the present extreme right-wing government is not a nationalism in economic terms, like it is for Trump. That is economic nationalism to defend their industries. This government in Brazil is only nationalistic in the sense of, of, of his fights against communism, the, which they see everywhere, against Islam, which is not present in Brazil, eh? and against what they call something like tech, techno bureaucrats mm. and, uh, and so. So, to, uh, what, what they do is that they, they, on the one hand there is a very nationalism on the superficially, and on the other hand, it's privatization mm. all over the place, privatizing of important uh, state banks, of important of our petrol, uh, and selling off everything to everybody. So it, it's, it's uh, selling out. Yeah. So is there a danger of South Africa suffering that popular anti-establishment sentiment? Um, especially, I mean, you said you were here several years ago when there was celebration of the Lula movement, hoping that it'll come here, and it failed to materialize. And now we've seen these violent outbreaks uh, in the cities, especially in Gauteng area, where a lot of it has to do with worker-based sentiments not being honored. Yeah. Well, we should be very careful in taking, uh, you know, we have to take in serious uh, the frustration of the people, uh, and uh, which not, they, which in many cases can't find an expression anymore in traditional organizations like unions, like political parties, and so, if we don't create uh, democratic institutions and, and, and democratic spaces uh, to listen to these people uh, and to interact with them then we will see that these frustrations can be easily manipulated. Yeah? Manipulated by ideologies or by some, some churches, in the case of Brazil, neo pentecostal churches, but uh, in, in a sense which is, doesn't give real solutions for the mm. country. Yeah? And behind that then you can see that there are um, opportunistic economic interests, yeah? but then uh, go into this pr uh, project, like is the case in Brazil with mm. Bolsonaro. So you cannot create a vacuum. Uh, we have now a new government in, uh, in South Africa, which has a huge responsibility, of course. We are following. Uh, this is, of course, uh, um, 
a very important moment for South Africa as well. Um, and uh, the, if, if, if the government fails uh, to really tackle the problems uh, of income and jobs, uh, and, and if the frustration rises, you create a vacuum and somebody is to occupy it and somebody will manipulate it. Uh, and this mm -hmm. happened in Brazil, it happened in the Philippines, more or less it's the same story in the UK, uh, where you see that the working class and the lower middle class, they voted for Brexit and created all the chaos that we see. So this is something that is all over the world. Mm. So, so uh, here, what, what, what would we say, how would we characterize it? Is that the rise of a new political elite? You spoke about when uh, Lula came into power that uh, there wasn't so much uh, support from the left, but there was definite opposition from the right. Is it something that you're seeing here in South Africa? Uh, how do you resolve that? Well, you, we have to uh, recognize uh, the, the reality how it is. Uh, and so we, 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 if there are strong forces in society, we have to dialogue with them. Uh, uh, we have to try to, to make an alliance, a compromise uh, around the development plan for the, for, for the country. And at the same time, we have to understand that we cannot solve our problems anymore only at national level. Uh, that's why the BRICS was so important uh, mm -hmm. and other initiatives. We have to come together and to say, for example, that the power of the financial sector and the, uh, the financial movements, the f inflows and outflows were destabilized, as happened in Brazil also. It's one, one of the reasons for the economic slowdown, am among many others. And uh, so we have to come up with solutions also at the international level, because mm. if we don't have strategies to so come out of So let's look at that. The, some would say there's a clear um, rise in anti-immigration sentiments uh, or policies that we, we certainly have seen in incoming governments uh, internationally as well. And I'll bring it back here to South Africa, where some are saying uh, just ordinary basic services are collapsing because of um, our porous borders, uh, high levels of immigration or, or, or foreign occupation of industries. How do we then m create that balance to make sure that there is a regional solution to something like this? No, well, first of all, the, these frustrations, uh, the, the, that's a case of manipulation. Uh, I, I don't know, of course, the details, but it's clear that here we see frustration among people it has to do with unemployment, it has to do with uh, problems with income, and, and you see that this is being manipulated and canalized uh, through, towards an enemy which is not the enemy. That is not the cause of the mm. problem, of course. But uh, we have to find other channels uh, uh, to debate and to recognize these problems. Uh, to understand that there is a rational, uh, the outcome if, is irrational, but there is a rational and the frustration of these people. Uh, and in, in, in both in the case of Brazil and in the case of South Africa, the regional cooperation is of course uh, very important uh, to find new ways uh, for development strategies. Uh, so I spoke about more international, but also at the regional level, this is among this topic. We so have to find new How do you have more strategies. humanist, more left policies given uh, this atmosphere or the environment that you talk about? Well, that is of course the main challenge and uh, to put the, the solidarity again on the agenda uh, and to, uh, to recognize governments uh, like left-wing democratic governments have to recognize where they failed uh, and to try to uh, uh, come forward with, you know, short-term policies which are directly related uh, to poverty, uh, to, to land, to housing. But these short-term policies they have be, must be part of a long-term project that has to be negotiated with all social forces mm. in Just society. Just as a final question, does it mean that democratic or democracy models are themselves fundamentally changing? Sure, the, the, the whole society is changing, both internationally, and we saw the things of the, of the fourth revolution and everything. And we have to find other ways to organize democracy. It's, it can be only the vote. Uh, uh, we, we have to give uh, opportunities to people to organize themselves and to put forward their, their, their ideas uh, and, and to, to assist in, in solutions. Uh, because otherwise, the frustrations are there. Uh, the economy, world economy, is a slowdown. Uh, it, it, it will not 
uh, the, the, the impact of the 2008 crisis is enormous, is still there. There's no country, uh, not even China, where there's not a slowdown in the economy. And this has impact, especially on the poor people. It has impact, uh, impact on the, on the diff more difficulties for job creation. So we have to give answers to that. Thank you so much Joe, for sharing your insights with us. Wish we had more time. Thank you very much, yeah, Professor sure. Jojo Romana Skitter. This has been on the record.